cool. Perfect. Okay, so today I'm sitting down with Penelope Boudreau, a recognized elder in the herbal community and a dear friend and longtime teacher of mine. She is a registered herbalist and founder of Back to Your Roots, a herbal retreat held at her farm and botanical sanctuary in Cannington, Ontario, where she also offers the herbal tree, uh, the ginkgo tree herbal course. Uh, Penelope has devoted over 25 years to helping others foster deep and resilient connections with the living intelligence of the natural world and the regenerative healing forces of the plants and the medicine they carry. So as much as we can dive into all that right now, I'm more curious of what first drew you to herbal medicine and where exactly did your plant path begin for you? Okay, Chelsea. Well, first I want to say how excited I am to be here because Chelsea, I've known for quite a while now and it's so exciting to see how she's taken off and what she's doing in this podcast and uh, video. So I think that that's amazing. Um, and what drew me first to herbal medicine? There's so many things, you know, when you look back, it's like childhood draws you to herbal medicine, being outside in the sun and the wind uh, and the rain and the moon. Um, all those things made me love and fall in love with nature. But then herbal medicine is all just part of that. And we're all connected in those ways, you know, through gardening, through vegetables vegetable gardening, flower gardening, uh, whatever it is, you know, if you're a lover of the outdoors. And so I was all of those things. And so knowing and learning that I could actually make a living from uh, doing what I love was kind of revolutionary to me. It was like, woohoo, this is great. So sign me up and here I am. I love that. I think I remember reading a story that you had written somewhere, or maybe somebody asked you a similar thing that you had been working on a farm. And by the end of the day, I think you were the only one left, but you were so shocked that someone could pay you to do this most exciting thing, right? Yeah, I didn't even think to add that, Chelsea. <laughs> that was so true. Yeah, my first job. And there was a gentleman and another lady. And it was like the guy, he just couldn't handle the heat. And he was gone pretty much right, you know, by noon. <laughs> and yeah, to think we can get paid for what we love is amazing. But we can. And we so can. it's great. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. And what first even do you think, because for so many people, even myself included, it's one of those things where as much of the herbal world or just the natural world that we can infuse into our lives as we can, it's this wonderful thing. But do you know at what moment you're, you had switched from thinking this is a lifestyle to this may be a professional career? Was it that experience on the farm that kind of made you realize that? Yes, definitely. Um, because of course, we never used to have the internet, right? So you were kind of in a little silo. Like I was in a silo here on my farm in central Ontario. There was not many people who were kind of like me really, who had this love of nature and plants so much. And so really everyone's really fortunate today to have the social networks online to be able to find like-minded people. But then to get off of it and actually do the work right and live the life so um yes you're absolutely right it um it's just been amazing to me to think that that first day on the farm i was picking petals what was i picking petals off of calendula i think and i was sitting under an apple tree which of course i love apple trees Mm -hmm. And I was outside and it's beautiful and, you know, and all is right in the world. And I was thinking, wow, to think someone would pay me to do this when really, quite literally, I would love to do that just for free because I just, it was just a beautiful moment. And I'll never forget it, right? This is 25 years later. I can still smell. It's like you can smell the air. You can <laughs> see the, feel the sticky of the flowers. Uh, you know, all those details with plants stay with you. And that's actually probably, it actually just warmed my heart even to just say that. And that is what I love about herbal medicine because when I look back, I can remember the day Darlene McIntyre and I went picking linden blossoms in this field. You know, like I can remember the creek, I can remember, and that was, that again is like 24 years ago or something. So to have those moments with plants that you 
will always remember. So it's just like another family member, right? In those mm -hmm. fond memories. It's so true. It reminds me of one of my first experiences working on a farm. And like you had said, I, I even speaking about it and remembering it, it feels like it was yesterday. I can remember and it, it, the early days of spring, it comes back to me, just the smell and just such a rushing gush, this memory. But it was it was being in the greenhouse and they had classical music playing in the background and it was raining. It was raining lightly. And we were just I can't remember, maybe we were planting or doing some transplants. And I just remember just such a wonder comes over you. It's, it's just such a connection that words, we don't even have words, I feel like, to describe it. It's just such a visceral feeling. And it's just, wow. I, I can absolutely resonate with that feeling of, of wonder. And I think so many other people can as well, once they put themselves in, in that position of getting your hands dirty and really feeling connected with, with the earth and the living world around us. It's so, so beautiful. And, and yeah, again, words just can't quite describe it, but it is, it's such a familiar feeling. And for you, I, I know that I, you obviously still work quite a bit with your dad. Was this something that you grew up with, with your parents also working with herbal medicine as well? Or was this something that you more so took on your own? Uh, so no, I, I introduced my dad to herbal medicine really. Um, but my grandmother really is my real connection to nature. And so she by far was my first, what I would call a nature lover, you know, where we would be outside together and we had that common bond. And my grandma was really a quiet woman and I am not necessarily. <laughs> and, um, but we were so connected in some way, and I don't even know, but for sure the gardening, the preserving, the tips that she would set, like there's so much I learned from her. But then again, my parents as well, because we always had a garden, you know, we raised chickens always, we sold eggs, we did all that stuff while I was little. So that definitely is part of my foundation. And then of course, as soon as um, I was married, I too had a big garden and got my kids had their own little garden where they sold pumpkins and gourds and corn and made their own pumpkin money and, you know, <laughs> enter into the fair, do all that stuff for kids. So the Nate, so I had the nature part down and the vegetable gardening and the flower gardening, but I didn't have the herbs down. You know, I only knew a little bit about it. And so it really intrigued me. So that was like a natural next step for me to um, get into herbal medicine. And I so love it because it's like foraging and wild crafting as well, right? So it's the easy part of gardening that you don't have to do the work. You can just go <laughs> pick something that's on your land. So that really appealed to me. How true is that? And I think that's the, it just speaks to the magic in it. As soon as you don't see a separation between yourself and the natural world, and when you start to incorporate it in the many ways, like you just described, it just, it fosters that deep resilient connection and, and the learning just never stops. I find once you, once you open that door, you know? And so for people wondering that maybe want to get into the similar, or a similar path, where would you recommend they go first as far as maybe where they might want to study? I know nowadays there's so many options because, of course, virtual learning is an option now, which is fantastic. We can learn from anywhere in the world. Uh, and, and so obviously there's so many more options. Where would you recommend someone start? And maybe you can speak to, to your herbal education and, and what that program was like for you. Yes. Um... So I think, first of all, it would be where, what is the person wanting to do? Because as you know, there's many different paths one can take with herbal medicine. So if you were really wanting to be a clinician and um, delve that deep into herbal medicine, then of course I would recommend the Dominion Herbal College. Uh, I do believe you and I both went there, mm -hmm. so which is great. Uh, yeah, and I really loved that program. Um, but I think that also, um, I think Wild Rose College also has something there for that. So that's if you want to be a, a clinician. Um, so does Elderberry Academy um, as well in Peterborough that I know. But if someone's wanting it as a lifestyle, because that's how I personally, that is more my mission in teaching, is I want more people to embrace it and and to be empowered to take care of your children and your families and yourself and your pets included with plant medicine. And by eating healthy plants that were not, you know, just uh, 
that are in the grocery store because you know there's only a small amount of our actual edible plants that make it in a grocery store and so there's so much more we could be eating and especially with the cost of groceries now you know there's so many things that are inexpensive and plentiful that we can be using um so i would recommend those people to take some sort of a beginner herbal course uh, so definitely our course, the Ginkgo Tree Herbal course is a beginner course, but Rosemary Gladstar also has hers online. Um, again, Wild Rose College would have that kind of information. Um, but I like to tell my students that for sure they should do some sort of a, a basic herbal course, definitely. But then I really like them to seek out other teachers. So I always recommend, you know, to go learn something with Tamara um, from Hawthorne Herbals or go learn something from Stephen Martin from the Sacred Gardener. Go learn something from Abra. Oh, Abra also does a herbal clinic uh, uh, as a teacher, you know, she teaches clinicians. Um, so there's so many people. So this is in my area, you know, um, Pat Crocker is another one uh, that is great to learn uh, stuff from. But I just feel that the more teachers you can meet and learn, and all teachers seem to have a little niche, you know, that that they're most interested in. So we all love herbal medicine. But then within that, there is some other little thing that these teachers are really passionate about. So there's, and finding out what that extra passionate thing is, that's what you want to learn from that person, I think, especially. Um, so I, I think that a online course is great, but if you can do something where you can gather in person, nothing beats the gathering in person and building communities and making friends, like-minded friends, that then you can travel to <laughs> little uh, conferences with. So that's actually how I met um, Aku Richter, Mama, uh, at Richter's Herbs, was she just one day randomly, I was walking through the greenhouse, invited me to go on a road trip to the States, to the International Woman, uh, the International Herb Conference. And we didn't really know each other at all. And I was like, okay. So off we went together and we've made a really amazing friendship just out of, you know, being able to step out of your comfort zone and just go on a road trip with someone you don't know very well in the herbal community and um, make friends. It's really great and worthwhile. So herbal medicine, it's not just about learning about the plants, it's learning we're all connected and building those long-term relationships with people and with the plants, I think. That's such a really good statement. And I think one of the things that I took the most from that is it's, it's honestly just taking the first step, finding, finding what aligns with you based on that maybe secondary thing to herbal medicine, whatever that secondary passion is that kind of falls underneath. But you sometimes don't know until you take that first step of just wanting to know more. And, and it's the people you meet along the way and it's the unpredicted paths that you end up going down. And, and that was the way it was for me. And of course, that's how Penny and I know each other because I had taken the Beginner's Herbal course through the Ginkgo Tree. So can you tell a little bit about, tell us a little bit about that course, just unpack that a little bit for people that are maybe wondering what they can do if they are listening within the area? Sure. So the reason I started that um, course was, um, oh, geez, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago or 20 years ago or something. I was in our little town with a friend of mine uh, who's from Vermont, Mount Pelier. And she was checking out our little town and she said, um, wow, she, she goes, in her town, she could throw 100 stones and hit 100 herbalists. And I said, wow, in my town, I could throw 100 stones and hit three you know, like it was just so small. And I thought, wow, I really need to do something where we can make this area, you know, a little more of a hub or something because Richter's is like within 30 minutes, Faunus Herbs is right here, you know, and then now of course, that's why I'm here. <laughs> and it's like, so in giving this course, it's just opened up our community to have so many more people that um, are involved in herbal medicine. So it's been great. And I didn't want to reinvent the wheel necessarily. So Rosemary Gladstar and I are friends. And I asked Rosemary if I could use her course because she's got a great uh, binder and course already made up, The Science and Art of Herbalism. But that the thing that I found that I would like to add to that was the hands-on and the in-person uh, and just having that support of a community. 
Uh, so we started doing that and we've had so much fun together and lots of students have graduated and some have no intention of ever graduating. They just want to come and do the hands-on stuff and be with the group, um, like-minded people. And we're also sponsored by Faunus Herbs. So lots of times we have lots of goodies that we give away or whatever we make, you know, everyone gets to take home. So it's actually made it where I have a few students, I would say several students now who actually make products and sell products because of learning that their passion was that they loved making stuff. And so, you know, now they have the nice packaging and beautiful labels and just to see women step out and you know, do that. It's so cool. So um, that's been really rewarding, rewarding for me. Oh, I love that. And you had shared with me once because we had been talking about this. And I, I think that's the thing that makes herbalism seem so vast and diverse because it really can look so many different ways. And for everybody, mm -hmm. it does. And I think that's the beautiful thing about it. I, I know personally, I'm one of those people that I always want to learn more. So it's just one of those fields that I never know everything. And I love that. I love not knowing everything. And there's always more to learn and there's always room for growth and it can take you down so many different paths that you'd never, ever think you'd land down. So can we touch on that a bit? Because you shared that with me with once through all the students that you see come and go, where can you share some examples of maybe how they've taken herbalism into their own lives and, and what that's looked like in, in many different ways? Yeah, that's great that you asked that because I almost wanted to interrupt you to say <laughs> how you are a good example because of your bees. And so last month, you actually, I had asked you to, to teach um, our students online because we were still online because mm -hmm. of COVID and uh, to teach them about using herbs and honey because you, of course, are a beekeeper as well. And so I cannot tell you, I believe that we just... I say we, you, inspired so many people to want to get their own bees again, because I have almost got bees before, but then have had to realize, no, I can't, because we have a bear here, right? So that would not be nice for the, for the bees, but it is the coolest thing, bees. And so you taught the students this other side of, you know, your love for pollinators, your love for the bees, and then of course, honey, and, and to be respectful of the bees. And, you know, and so that also teaches that interconnectedness with the students and for them to learn, you know, the planet. And even them learning from you about, you know, there wouldn't even be vegetables, basically, like her food, if there wasn't for our pollinators. So just teaching and opening the eyes of your passion to someone else, that was a really big example. So I think that was an amazing example for me. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that, Penny. And it, it really has been, I feel like the first finding my way with herbs. And of course, like you said, it begins when we're kids. It's not something that I think, yeah. I think it starts basically from the moment we enter this world, because we're all, always in connection with the natural world, but it just, it, it continues to open so many more doors and the more people you meet along the way. So for example, like Penny just mentioned, the talk that I had done for the ginkgo tree through that, I've been asked now to write an, uh, an article on beekeeping and ethical beekeeping and honey and herbs. So it just, you never know. And I just always like to say, yes to every opportunity that comes because you never know where it'll take you and sometimes you don't realize how much you like like certain things until you try them and then you realize hey I love speaking or hey I love writing or I like drawing or creating things like you know some people may have learned that they love to do through your course and there's just so many different ways that that can look and I know for a lot of people that are getting into it as a profession, can you maybe share with us what a typical day or a typical week looks like in your world and just what that practice looks like as a herbalist on a very day-to-day -day basis? Yes, so depending on the season, a week or a day looks really different as we, we know. Um, so always three days a week, I'm working at Faunus Herbs. So that's pretty much you know standard. I'm in my office, I'm answering emails, I, you know, do our site license, our organic certification, any audits that we have with the government or the FDA audits. So I have that whole side of me, the professional herbal side, where if you're a large corporation, like a herbal corporation, that's a whole different ballgame than kind of what we've been talking about so far. So that's kind of uh, another hat that I wear. And that's the three days a week. 
but then depending on the weather. So like in the winter, we're just coming out of the winter. So in the winter, I find myself more in my clinic, more doing inventory, checking out the herbs. I find myself um, making up lessons more, uh, packing orders for people more. Um, but then I also, that's the time when you get ready for year end. So as a business owner, if you're going to have a herbal business, then of course you have your book work to do. And so I, um, that's actually my least favorite part of herbal medicine. <laughs> Having my own business is my book work, but I'm very thorough and I do it. And so that's good. Um, mm -hmm. So then, but then winter is also thinking of spring and it's the sitting with a cup of tea and you're cozy you know under a blanket looking through seed catalogs like there's nothing nerdier than a bunch of herbalists with their catalogs out in the middle of the winter deciding ooh, what am I going to buy this year and <laughs> and I I don't know anyone with unlimited money so it's always difficult because you have to decide you've got so much of a budget what am I going to do this year and what can I do and so that's always super fun deciding, you know, and seeing what uh, someone else is plant, going to plant or, and I guess also making up our um, plans for the garden, you know, like what rows are going to be what and what type of, unless you forest garden or something. Um, so that, that is uh, winter. So then spring, so now we're into spring. So spring, it's like all of a sudden, magically one day you're outside again all the time. So mine started on uh, Saturday with boiling sap all, and that happened, we were just talking about that, Chelsea, that was the first day of spring, technically, and I didn't realize it when we planned the boil, it just worked that way. But so for me, that was my first day out, and then today was glorious, so I was out all morning, and now it's just going to be this cascading of, you know, doing all your early spring chores, and, and of course, being on a farm, I have more things to do than if I had a smaller yard in town. Um, so it just starts all of a sudden and you've got to just get your uh, self organized. So then it would be picking up your seeds, picking up your plants, planting them, making sure that you don't get them too soon where maybe they die or they, they don't. Because I like to have my plants and put them right in from the nursery. I don't like to hang on to them. Some people do, but I don't. I like to get them from there where I know they're good and not shock them at all with then coming to my place and sitting somewhere. Um, so then right out and start planting. And I also plant a lot of trees. So it's also finding out like budget wise, can I, how much can I afford in trees? And so which trees do I wanna get? Can I afford to have them deliver them or do we have to go get them? Cause then that's a whole day. So there's all these huge things and then watering. Any, gosh, we, water so much and I'm so thankful I have two apprentices that help me so that really lightens the load but it's funny because in the dead of winter this year I actually turned to my partner Will and I said to him I'm, I'm, I'm missing watering even when meanwhile that's just one of those chores that never ends in the summer and you're like oh please don't rain so I don't have to water but I actually was like I would love to go water right now you know just to be out and how the trees and the plants are doing um yeah and preparing beds so now it's time to prepare beds have your straw for mulch you know all that stuff and and I don't um uh harvest a ton and plant a lot for my my clinic because working with Faunus Herbs I already have that at my fingertips so I'm not going to reinvent the wheel so I find I do that a lot with work I don't reinvent. I work smarter, not harder. That's my little mantra, I say, because some things can really make me money and other things don't. And so I, you need to establish if the things that don't make you money are your heart's work, awesome. Then that's what we do as well, right? But if it's part of your income, I need to draw my attention to what actually makes my income and how can I, I make my income best um, with all the, the different gifts and talents uh, and skills that I've acquired over the years. Um, so I also do a lot of shows. So, and that's kind of all year long as well, actually. But in the herbal community, a lot happens from summer till fall. There's all kinds of shows where you're lecturing and speaking and going to. So that 
that's starting now. So organizing all that. Um, and then fall, there would be harvesting. Well, there's harvesting spring, summer, and fall. So there's whatever it is you want to gather. And that's, that's part of a lifestyle, isn't it, Chelsea? Like where you just spring, you start picking and you just don't stop picking. And well, even you're picking in the winter, whatever you can pick, you're picking. So and, true. and yeah. So, um, in the fall in particular, I have to, oh, I have a lot of rabbits. That's one thing. In the fall, I start late fall wrapping things with chicken wire and my trees all with guards and because rabbits destroy so much of my stuff. So until they get bigger and established. So, um, and I really, like I almost cried two years ago. I walked out into the uh, botanical sanctuary that we here have here, Kinnegago Botanical Sanctuary for Endangered Plants. And a bunch of my trees were chewed right down and deer as well. It's deer and rabbits. Mm. So we did a big thing where we started, cow you know, so right now everything's safe. They're wrapped and they're good and, and I'll leave them that way till they get much bigger. But it's just even learning what animals, which is great that they're here, the rabbits and the deer, love it. But I also have to protect my investment because it is an investment we had to pay money to buy all these trees and they're so expensive um so i want them to live like i hate to lose a tree or a bush or a plant it's really quite sad and disheartening but it happens right mm -hmm. um so then once the first snow comes it almost is a little bit of a ah <sighs> because it's a busy <laughs> spring, summer, winter, and then you're chomping at the bit in the middle of the winter to start it all over again. So it's, but the seasons are beautiful. I love having winter because I love to have that bit of a quiet time and then reflect back over the seasons and see what to do the next year. How true. I remember once you had said to me and it was in the middle of winter and I think I, I had made a comment of, oh, I'm not getting to work with my hands as often as I would like. And you, you had said something along the lines of, but you're not meant to, like, this is the time to sit and reflect and learn and plan and, and do all this reflection and, and thinking ahead and also reflecting of what just happened in the past year. But in order to, to go about spring when it comes and just enjoy the quiet and the slow pace and enjoy that, because that's kind of it's a season led life. And I think just being so connected to the natural world makes you live a life that is so revolving around the seasons and the cycles. And, and, and so I think it's just finding, finding the right thing for the right time of year. And, and like you just said, every season looks so different. And again, I think the diversity that comes with being a herbalist and being able to work in such a, such a field is, is one of the wonderful benefits of it. And there are many, but um, it definitely is one of them. So you touched on two things that I just want to unpack a little bit before we move on. Um, your apprenticeship program, if somebody is listening and is interested in that, I know you mentioned they help with the watering, which any hands are helpful when it comes to that, because we have to do the same here. We are so dry. Um, last year, I think we got a little bit lucky, though, because I don't remember watering quite as much as the year before. But anyways, can you tell us a little bit about the apprenticeship program just before we move on? Sure. The apprenticeship program, um, a student normally writes into me and tells me why they would want to be an apprentice. And it's on our website, the ginkotree.ca, um, under education. But they, they, because I can learn a lot from the way someone writes, you know, and, and is it in their heart? And so you want to have someone work with you or you want to work with them that is in love with plants and that is in love with nature and that really wants to make a difference somehow. Um, so the two girls I have right now are amazing and um, they are both so different and yet bring, and that's the cool thing about herbal medicine again, how we're all individuals and they bring something so different to the farm, you know, here. So it's wonderful. And then also that's a bond that apprentices make with one another because you're learning together too, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so they also receive the, the ginkgo tree herbal course. So they get to do the course. And so the apprenticeship program is over two years. So the idea is that, you know, all summer they're hands on and they're working and they're immersed in stuff at their own place and here, but then all winter they're supposed to be working on their course well they could work on it all year if they wanted to but for sure in the quiet of the winter as you know that's a time many herbalists do writing make blogs up do 
uh, write books, articles, all that kind of thing. So it's just good. It teaches the apprentices right away to get into that uh, swing of going through the seasons and where we can uh, best put our skills. Um, yeah, and they're invaluable. They also come and help me uh, if they are able, and it's, it works out in their schedule, to help with Back to Your Roots Herbal Retreat and our Lady Slipper uh, Plant uh, and Woman Gathering. So that's also excellent. Oh, I love that. And for those of you who are listening, you can tell already it would be amazing to work under Penny. I wish I lived closer to you, Penny, because I would love to apprentice under you. Um, so if, if anyone's listening, I would highly recommend it, of course. Um, and just while we're on the topic, can you tell us a little bit about the Ginkgo Trees um, Back to Your Roots? And well, this year, of course, Back to Your Roots isn't happening. Instead, it's going to be the Lady Slipper. Uh, can you share a little bit about that event? Sure. Um, well, first I'll touch on Back to Your Roots. So we didn't plan it this year because that's our larger event. And we have usually, I don't know, up to a max of 150 people or something. Um, and that's just a one day um, event. People come for the whole day and there's a, a music at night and it's just such a packed full day of an event. And it was made for the idea of the local people, but People come from all over for that day's event, which is awesome now. Um, but it's not happening because I didn't want to have to ask about passports and, you know, do any COVID restrictions. So we'd started Lady Slipper last year, and actually we just called it Herb Camp. And we really wanted to get people still together because everyone was so missing community, right, with not being able to see people and all these lockdowns that we've had. And so we thought... We were allowed to gather, I think it was 50 people to, at that time or something. So we thought, okay, well then let's do a gathering with just 50 people and we'll make it be a camp over instead. And so now we stay overnight. People stay here at the farm and camp on the Friday night and it starts on the Friday night and then all day Saturday and Sunday. And we're just like five minutes from the lake. So some of the girls will get up early in the morning and drive to the lake and go for a swim. And we have music and there's art and uh, some really amazing um, women lecturers. And I've been really drawn to um, uh, doing something just for women. Mm -hmm. Love men, men are great. <laughs> <laughs> but somehow I'm drawing to this feminine power that I just really love and get inspired myself by women and by young women and who you connect with, you know, because it, it doesn't matter age. Age is irrelevant on that connecting level, right? You just connect with who you connect with. So it's such a wonderful spot, these little retreats, and there's more online. You need to check them out um, where then you can meet your people <laughs> and form bonds and get together and just enjoy good food, you know, from local uh, farmers that are growing in the area and just learn some really great information. And even at an event like that, at Lady Slipper in particular, I also learn, you know, like wherever I am, if I teach somewhere, I learn as much as I teach. And um, so that's a really important thing as a teacher to, you know, be open to see what you learn and what's your big takeaway from a weekend. Um, but the name is something unique that I wanted to share with you because Lady Slipper, actually in our botanical sanctuary, we have a Lady Slipper that came, so that's an endangered or orchid, and it came all on its own. I didn't, I wasn't even the first one to see it. We were going on a herb walk one day, and at the end of the herb walk, I asked my, um, little, my sidekick, Serena, who I work with, I said to Serena, she was taking photos. So I said, well, Serena, what was your favorite plant that you saw today? Which is so nerdy. Instead of saying, oh, who was your favorite person to take a picture of? It's like, what plant did you like to take a picture of? And she says to me, oh, the yellow, the yellow one. And I was like, the yellow one. I said, there's not a yellow one out there right now. And she said, yes. And so she took me back to it. Cause I was like, show me. And she took me over to it. And here it was a lady slipper. I was like, oh my goodness, it's like build it and they will come. And so to have a lady slipper come all by herself to that little, it's maybe a five acre parcel of land or something, which was just a plowed field when we moved here. And um, now it's full of all kinds of plants and it's full of um, a lot of native species, but also some invasives, which, you know, so I'm 
always trying to add more at risk and endangered plants, but then I'm also always trying to <laughs> not have so many uh, invasives. So it's this balancing act that we're always doing out there. But the name lady slipper, it just meant so much to me to think that here we have that lady slipper out there. And then it, it was actually Abra who thought of the name. And then it's a gathering for women and plants. So it just seems so fun and beautiful to me. How fitting. It reminds me of the first time I saw Lady Slipper up here. And I remember driving, I take, there's this kind of back scenic road that I take to work every day and, or the days that I do go in anyways. And I remember seeing a little yellow flower just in my periphery as I'm driving. And it was one of those moments where you, you know, you hard brake and you almost hit your steering wheel. And I was like, wait a sec, you know, and I doubled back and I went back to it. And sure enough, same, same thing. It was a Lady Slipper and I had never seen one before. And I just, in awe. If anyone's listening to this, Google it. It is the most beautiful, the most beautiful little flower. And I just think it's, it's the most perfect name for, for women gathering. So um, I'll of course link to uh, all the, the links that are necessary in the show notes so people can learn more about the event and how they can maybe attend. Is there still space actually, or is it full already? Yes. Oh, there's still space. Nope. There's still space. Okay. Yes. Perfect. And so so the, I'm a co um, I'm a co organizer of that, right? So that is actually Abra Arneson and myself who are doing the Lady Slipper. Okay. And Chelsea, I just wanted to mention something that you said. You said you caught something out your peripheral. So being a herbalist is really something where you learn to use, like, and I love this saying owl eyes so that you're supposed to always be looking even out here, right? Like an owl all around. And you're supposed to have deer ears for <laughs> hearing, you know? And so as a nature lover, we need to remember to tune into our own senses because sometimes I've even been walking to go out to the drive shed and all of a sudden I'll smell something. And I'm like, oh my goodness, is that the black locust? And then you look up because it's really high up Ooh. and it'll be in bloom. And so I wouldn't have noticed except that I smelt it first, you know? I mean, eventually I would have noticed because I would have been looking for it because <laughs> that's what I do. But we thought looking at something to remember we have ears and a nose and, you know, and our, our sense of touch. And we need to really get into that and remember that those are gifts for us to use. Absolutely. And I don't think in our modern day that we use them often enough, but it's just a reminder that we can. So owl eyes, deer ears, I will <laughs> note that for future, but it, it's engaging with our senses, like you said, in so many ways, right? Just using all of those, all of those aspects just to just to find connection. It reminds me of something that I had read and it's um, like in the Buddhist practice where they walk the, the same path all the time. And, and every time they walk it, the meditation is to maybe notice something different, even on the path that you walk every single day. And I, I put that into practice here. You know, we, we've let our, 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 we have just a small acre parcel in, in the middle of pasture land, but we, we let it all grow wild. And then we just mowed basically a square around the, the lawn so we can get to every corner if we needed to, but not mowing more than we have to. Right. And so Brandon and I, my partner, Brandon, we, it's kind of like our nightly thing. You know, he comes home from work or I come home from work, whoever's home first and, and we'll do our lap around the yard. And it's, it's, well, what do we notice today that we maybe didn't notice yesterday? And it's just, it's finding those simple nuances and those things that make us stop and go, hmm, you know, and just allow us to connect a little deeper with what's around us. Cause it's so alive. It's, it's always there. And we just don't, don't often enough connect with it. Right. And it's just waiting. It just wants to connect with us, the nature. Right. So it's just this beautiful way to, to change, change your surroundings without actually going anywhere different. The, the surroundings are always changing around you. Right. But on that note, let's talk about your botanical sanctuary a little bit. Um, could you tell us the story of how it was named and just maybe paint us a picture of, of what it looks like? Sure. So how about I'll paint the picture first, what it looks like, because the name came after. Okay. So it didn't have a name. And so we've lived here on the farm for about, uh, I'm not sure, 34, 35 years now. And there was a parcel, maybe five acres beside the farmhouse here. And on the other side of it is like a bit of a, a bush. And then it goes another bush across the road and into a swampy area. So there's lots of 
of wildness. But there was this big barren five acre field, you know, plowed with no life, it didn't seem, um, beside the house here. And so I thought, ooh, if only that forest, that bush could come over this way and take over that and come right up to near the house. That would be so cool. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't even realize at that time, even though I say that the field was barren and looked like there was no life, obviously there was so much life that I just wasn't aware of beneath the soil and on the soil. There were seeds and there would be runners and the forest next door, the bush would be coming under the fence and, you know, spreading roots my way. And so we decided when we were fencing just to fence that off. And I started making paths out there. And some of the first things that came were like uh, box elders, Manitoba maples. And so I trimmed those all. Meanwhile, most people want to get rid of those, <laughs> but they came. So I was like, oh, I'm going to take care of these. And I trimmed them up so that, you know, they would have like a trunk and not all these suckers and stuff. And I spent a lot of time trimming this one little colony. And my son was little at the time with his little, my youngest son with his little friend. And they were maybe five. So I spent the day, my thing was trimming these trees. And when I came back later, they had lopped off some of them. <laughs> and I was like, ah! So, you know, not only do you have to worry about deers and stuff, you have to watch out for kids. But yeah. anyway, so many trees and plants just came on their own out there, which I loved. And so we planted lots of trees. So I already was planting and growing no endangered plants because I didn't even really understand what plants were endangered or what were, I wasn't there yet, you know, in my walk. So um, I'd already planted all kinds of plants and there was all kinds of native plants. And so it was just this cool space that I love to walk in and take the dogs. And it was just, you know, so lovely. But then the more I got into herbal medicine, then I started planting more herbs out there and uh, you know, like uh, horseradish or comfrey, uh, all kinds of tons of comfrey out there, uh, adding raspberries that were my papa's raspberries. Um, so all kinds of things we added out there and all kinds of trees came on their own and just full of life, like huge ant hills, you know, like two feet high, you know, those great big ones, which are amazing because that is so cool in the ecosystem to have these giant ant hills out there. Um, so just birds, so many birds. And so it just makes me just happy just being out there because all that was just happening, you know, organically on its own from when we first gave the space, you know, it's like you need to just give the space to nature and then nature will move in and you can help it, you know, you can add <laughs> other native species that are around, but it's amazing to see all what comes right when you just allow it to grow and do its thing. Um, so then as years went by and I, um, I actually was, and oh, I know, I planted echinacea out there because echinacea is a, a wildflower here in Ontario that you just don't see anymore. So I had planted a whole bunch out there and I have it growing, which is amazing. This one patch, it's probably 20 something years old. Mm. Um, but the only reason I got it because I knew echinacea from working at Faunus. And of course, Richter's is here. So I, you know, buy all kinds of stuff from Richter's. Um, so it just turned out really cool that I had these plants already. And then when I was with a coup at the International Women's Symposium in the States, I was wandering around the vendors and there was United Plant Saver booth. And I was like, oh, hi girls, you know, and there were some young girls, man in the booth and it was great. And I was like, so what's United Plant Savers? So they told me and I was like, oh my goodness, I basically do this already at home, but I didn't have a name for it. I couldn't articulate it. I didn't have a end goal. You know, I was just at the process of planting and giving the land to nature. And because we'd also gave the back 50 acres of our property to nature too. So I have paths all out there. And I'd always had this thing where I wanted to know that before I died, I planted 2000 trees. And I don't know why I had that crazy <laughs> number in particular, but I did. So when I came home from that trip, I became a member of United Plant Savers. I began to look at their work. I began to make sure that now I look on their list of endangered plants that are from 
our area, but I also look now on, so I'm from Ontario, of course, so then I look on the Ontario endangered plant list. So I go on our government website. So I seek out what are the plants that maybe need my help. And I want to make sure they're at least growing here somewhere in some colony um, so that I've at least preserved this one little group over here that maybe could in turn by squirrels or birds or, you know, bugs, whatever, be transported somewhere else into a forest setting or into a field somewhere where an animal may take it. Um, so it just really excites me to think that, uh, you know, I can make a difference that way. Because also then that starts to get into your understanding about climate change and all what's happening in the world around us. So it just mm -hmm. speaks to this bigger picture mm -hmm. as well of us doing a work that is beyond ourselves, perhaps. But when I started it, I was thinking that I was um, creating this space to kind of balance out the effect I've had on the on the planet since just being alive like driving my car all this you know your waste at the landfill all your all the impact I have had a ripple effect on creating on the planet because I have no idea what actually I've done to harm the planet which you know could be in a big way you know wherever your gas came from who knows so I thought that doing this work here was kind of like a a balance where I was kind of giving back and it was like covering me. Whereas now I just think it's, it's bigger than me. It is this um, work that's really my heart's work that then I can share with other people and then other people do it too, which is the whole goal of United Plant Savers, of course, right? Mm -hmm. So they inspired me and then to do more. And then I hopefully inspire somebody else to do more. And so through just inspiration, you know, we can have a, make a big difference. And um, I'm part of the American Herbalist Guild. Um, I do their meetup Mondays and I um, talk specifically on plant sanctuaries and on endangered and at-risk plants with the American uh, Herbalist Guild. So it's really good because we're reaching actually like all of North America. And so you don't have to be on a farm or have a large amount of property to make a difference. You could just live in town and have just, like you said, you left, um, you mow as little as you can. So even if you only mowed two thirds of your lawn instead of the whole thing, mm -hmm. you know, that third that you've left behind, mm -hmm. if you leave it out back and plant some trees and shrubs in there and let whatever grow up or add wild plants, that would be a whole neat little belt of, of an ecosystem, you know, that you're creating and that maybe your neighbor will then match beside you. And then that would be doubled, you know, like it would just be really cool. So there's so many things that we can do. Um, so then I was kind of like never having a name to express what it was like. So my business is called the Ginkgo Tree, but it, it's got nothing to do with the, my business. And so um, I was thinking like, I feel like it, I need to have a name to articulate what I'm doing here. And so uh, you and I actually have mutual friends. Uh, so I'm really great friends with the mom and you are with her daughter. So my dear friend, Lori um, is an indigenous woman and uh, an Anishinaabe woman. And I asked her, do you think that you could think of a name for me? To, Cause I don't know what to call the sanctuary. She was like, okay, leave that with me. I was like, okay. So I don't know, quite a bit of time went by, maybe a month, you know, because you just have to wait. And so for Lori, when they're going to name, when her people name something, it's like she's waiting for spirit to, to tell her what she thinks, you know, so it's in her mind. She maybe prays, maybe walks in nature. I'm not sure what her whole process is, but she came, she got a name. And so instead of telling me the name ahead, uh, she came and it was just Lori and I, and we had a naming ceremony and it was so lovely. So we were here by ourselves and the dogs were out with us and I had a fire ready and um, Lori came over and she drummed and sang and, and she did a whole naming ceremony for the sanctuary. So it's called Kinegego, which means all things. And when Lori explained it to me, you know, she 
was saying that to her, she felt that the sanctuary was for all things because we have the wildlife, deer, coyote, bobcat, you know, bears. There's all kinds of, I saw bobcat, I, maybe I already said that. But anyway, there's all kinds of nature. But then there's the plants, you know, that we, we have and the endangered plants, but then there's the rocks and the minerals and the, you know, I also, I don't know many people would say this out loud, but I'm gonna say it anyway. I have like this favorite rock that I love that I gifted to someone. So it's like I, it's like the rock is almost like a, that's not like a person, but it's a thing, it's, it's alive. It's something that you can love and really care about, right? So, you know, so she knows I'm that way a little, that's a, it's kind of quirky, but anyway. Um, so it was like every element in life, you know, and she even said my partner, she said, and, and, you know, we have a love and that there's this love here. And so she just kind of covered everything. And it was like, it was all things to her is in the end, what it felt like. And it felt really perfect for me. That was a perfect name because I want it to be all things. And I want people to come here. And I think that they, they do because many people say it to me, but to feel welcomed and to feel at peace and to feel that they love nature and to be inspired, you know, to leave here and want to do work and just really be rejuvenated by the space and feel at home. Um, because it's not for me that I'm doing all of this. It's like, I'm doing it. I don't know what am I doing it for? I'm doing it for the, the greater, you know, for the planet, I guess. It sounds kind of goofy when you say you're doing it for the planet. Like, you know, how does one little person make a difference? But I feel like we can, I honestly do. And, and it's been demonstrated to me that I am making a difference. I know I'm making a difference. Um, and then like you're making a difference, Chelsea, right now, even just having this talk, because now this will have a, a larger audience where people will even hear this, right? So it all makes a difference, so. But I'm really appreciative to Lori for uh, coming up with that name and spirit because I thought it was just so beautiful and a really memorable time, you know, for her doing the ceremony and the naming just as two friends being together, you know, doing that. And I oh thank you so much for sharing that with us penny i think that's such a great story and as people can imagine for those listening that your your place your sanctuary your farm everything about it i think it inspires people to rekindle the relationship with the natural world like we've been saying this whole time right it just it's the ripple effect that it has and it, it never ends it never ends with ourselves. It always, it always moves forward. And I think, again, it, it, it's so funny. I think it always goes farther than the eye can see, right? Like we, we create these actions and you never know where it's going to go. And even this, this conversation, the work that you're doing, it just, it, it never stops once it starts. It, it becomes an entity. It becomes its own life, you know, this, this force of change. And I, I think it's just a wonderful thing. And so for people listening, I know we talked about it a little bit, but for those listening that want to give back that maybe don't have property or don't have access to anybody who does to have an influence in that way, do you have some ideas that you could share with us that people can go out and, and maybe take a first step right now? Because I think the hindrance often lies with the amount of things that you can do and the magnitude that those things might have. But I think just taking, again, that first step is is sometimes the hardest thing to do, but also the easiest once you just actually go ahead and do it. So for those, again, that maybe don't have a similar circumstance, do you have any ideas that you could maybe share? Like we had already talked about, of course, rewilding some space. We've done that here. And, and it's so interesting to hold space for anything that wants to come in, all things, like you said. So if you have anything to share, I would love to hear it. Yeah, I think that's a great question because you know, for all the work that I have to do here, um, I'm not wealthy. And my biggest obstacle, I shouldn't say that I'm wealthy in so many ways. I don't have, you know, a ton of disposable income to go purchase things. Um, so I find it 
difficult sometimes to be able to uh, buy as much as what I want to do here. Like I have the space to do so much more. So when I mentioned earlier about saying I had wanted to plant 2000 trees for some reason, that was the number I had in my mind. One day I took the dogs and we went for a walk. This is maybe uh, two years ago. And I thought, how many trees have I actually physically planted? I just wanted to count them. So tons have come on their own. So like hundreds and hundreds have come on their own. So that's fabulous. But it was like, how many I planted? So the dogs and I went all over and it was something like 334 or some crazy little number. And I was like, what? Is that all? And I couldn't believe it was such a small number because I've been planting forever, like whenever it's Mother's Day, you know, like I'm always asking for trees and it's my thing. And so any <laughs> extra money I have, like I'm not a drinker or a smoker or anything like that, like any extra money I have, it's like buying stuff, yeah. spring and fall. <laughs> so I was so disappointed. And um, so I was saying, so I was so disappointed that I said to my friend Nick at Faunus Herbs, I was like, ah, I walked and I only had like 334 trees or something. I was like, I was so disappointed. And he's like, Penny, it shouldn't be you who's buying all these trees. You need to ask people to buy you trees, ask people for money. And I was like, I can't ask people for money. Like, I hate asking them. I would, I like to be the giver. I don't like to be the receiver. So I was like, I can't do that. And plus though, I know that already, you know, you need to put it out there to the universe and wherever and that, you know, it'll happen and it'll come. And I'm a firm believer in that. But yet when it came to my trees, for some reason, I was not, and I don't know why. So anyway, then I was speaking to another friend of mine, Dr. Mikkel Friedman called me, who is um, restorative medicine conference in the U S who I work with him as well. He's a dear friend. We've worked together maybe 20 years. Anyway, he was asking me what's going on. How's Nick? How's my sanctuary? And anyway, so then I said to him, ah, I told him the same story. Ah, mm -hmm. I, you know, went for a walk with the dog. I only have, so here I told the same story to Mikkel. And we end up hanging up after our nice catch up conversation. He calls me back and he said to me, Penny, I want to donate you 10,000 to your sanctuary to buy trees. I was like, what? No. And he's like, I'm going to gift you $10,000 for your sanctuary. It literally made me cry. And that's 10,000 US, not Canadian. <laughs> and I was like, what? Wow. And it made me cry. And I was like, oh my goodness. So, and so Mikel is so awesome as a company. Like here's a company making a difference. When we yeah. fly in for conferences, I yeah. already knew that he planted trees for that. He just did it through a company, like another organization, you know? Yeah. So he always planted trees already. He used yeah. vegetable inks. He just, everything about their company is so sustainable and so good and so ethical and just, you know, right on exactly the type of company you'd want to work with. But yeah. then for him to gift that to me, you know, just this gal on the dirt road here in <laughs> Ontario to do that. It just floored me and it's so wonderful. And so with his funds, I was able to plant in one fell swoop, 2000 trees mm -hmm. and then like seedling trees mm -hmm. And then plant again another 33, I think it was, or 35. I have it all, I have it all written down, right? Um, but I have planted those in the sanctuary as well. Plus, I did another strip of wildflowers for pollinators. Plus, this year I'm getting another thousand trees planted this spring. So that'll be three thousand trees plus um, you know, the the other stuff that you did. So being able to just do something like that. I mean, not everyone can do that, of course. I mean, that's a once in a lifetime. But man, it just impacted me so much. And I already thought he was a wonderful person. But for him to care about the planet like that, and to help me with my mission, you know, because that's like a personal thing for me. It was unbelievable. So for people, if they have any funds, 
that they could go on United Plant Savers and they could donate it to United Plant Savers because they also have a bursary on there for people who are conserving and, and doing conservation work and planting plants. And you also could even go onto their map of where there are sanctuaries in your area. And you could reach out to that sanctuary even and say, hey, can I donate some money towards your planting this year or something. So, you know, that is huge because sometimes people can do the physical work. So I got that down. I got the physical work down. I can do it all. I can do all that. But, you know, sometimes the, that money directly made me be able to plant 3,000 trees. That's huge. And then now that I'm on a roll with it, I'm like, I'm keeping that momentum going. I, I have the land that I can do that. So I'm going to keep doing it uh, some way, somehow. Right. Uh, but also when I said I have the physical work down pat, I do, but sometimes it's bigger than me. So the one year we did a lot of invasives taking away buckthorn. We have buckthorn that the Europeans came and planted in fence rows, which spreads like crazy. So there was a lot of buckthorn. So I had a set amount of $1,000 that I paid a guy to come and dig out buckthorn. And I mean, he, you know, didn't really touch it. You know, there's a lot there. But then I had to get it out of the sanctuary. That was such hard work. And so I actually reached out on Facebook, I think it was, and asked, could some people come and help? So I had my two apprentices. And then I had like maybe three other people come. And so we spent that whole day and got rid of tons. So sometimes you just even need that extra help where someone could come for a day and do something. That makes a big difference, you know, just your physical self coming and helping with something. So that's also amazing. And again, you could reach out to local uh, sanctuaries using that United Plant Savers map and you'll see the little pins of where people are. So that would be great. But I think also just becoming a member of United Plant Savers definitely um, helps because that's how they, you know, are funded to do their great work. Um, yeah, so I think there's a few good ways of, of helping um, besides doing things themselves, right? Of course, of taking seeds with them out into nature and and leaving behind when they're out in a, in a nice area. Absolutely. I think that it just reminds me of a personal experience that's somewhat similar to your tree, tree experience. And that I think it was, was it last year or the year before? I can't remember now, but Brandon and I were looking at each other and we just really wanted to plant more trees than we could also afford on our property here. And, and so we're just back and forth, like trying to crunch some numbers, figuring out how we're going to buy the trees that we want to buy. Right. And, and doing this stuff. And, and so we, we, we slept on it and it was maybe a week or two had passed. And one of our friends who's a farmer in town, he was clearing out land for pasture because he's a cattle farmer. And usually he would just cut up the trees and, and sell the wood and, and that would be what he does. But since we put it out there that we wanted trees, he had suggested that instead of doing what he would normally do, he'll dig up each tree and then we can transplant it. And we'll plant it here instead. And that was... And so it just reminds me of when you want something bad enough and you put it out there, you, the universe conspires to, to make it so right. And it, it just, it goes to show that you just have to be maybe vocal about what you want, or maybe take that first step and even thinking about maybe the, the variables and all that sort, sort of thing. Right. But that was, that was our way of doing it. Right. We couldn't afford the trees, but we saved these trees from being um, basically demoed. Um, and now, and now we're giving them a second chance and we have our trees and it was, it worked out in that way. And the amount of bartering that you can do, I think people forget about bartering. Penny and I, we've bartered even in the past and it, it's just this great way to bring whatever you have to the table and then whoever else you're dealing with can do the same. And it's just this great way to exchange energy instead of, instead of money. Cause we don't all have that. Right. And, you know, we're very much the same. We don't have a lot either. And we're working within our means, but I think you can do a lot more than maybe people can realize. And like you said, giving back and donating and just every little thing that you can do goes a long way. And it just, even if it, the action itself doesn't go too far, it's, it's who you inspire along the way. And, and, you know, when you do that one thing, like, again, letting space grow wild, 
your nature, nature, nature meets you where you're at and stuff will blow in. And, and sometimes you don't have to do as much as you think you do. You just have to, again, take that first step. So thank you for sharing. Those were some really, really good examples. Um, and I have one question too, just, just to unpack the, the endangered species. And I have a question that was brought to my attention and I figured, oh, I've got the best person to ask this. Um, so what are your thoughts are, of course, planting endangered species is great, um, especially if it's, um, what was it that I used? Oh, I had used, was it golden seal last year? So I remember as soon as you told me it was something that I had needed for, for something that we don't need to get into for someone else, but you had said, this is obviously an endangered one. This is one that you should plant, you know, just a way to give back. And I had thought about it and someone had asked basically if, if they're using, for example, an endangered species and they want to plant it, but it's not a native plant, would you still recommend that that gets planted or would you rather that be executed in a different way, maybe recommending that somebody within its its native area planted instead? Or how do you feel about that? Because it's it's kind of the activist dilemma sometimes, whether it's you're you don't always know what's the best approach. So I don't know if you have any insight on that, but I figured I'd ask you. Yes. So the farther I am down the road of the path that I'm taking, I would really be more inclined to say plant native and um, use, seek out the invasives in your area and use those for medicine if you can, is a great idea. Um, but it, I think it is also okay, as long as a plant that you're planting isn't an invasive species, you know, that it will take off and be crazy here, to have it in our gardens, in a controlled setting where it's not escaping into the wild and taking over areas. Now, I, with the example of the golden seal, I think it's really amazing to make sure that we support our farmers. So when we're buying golden seal to make sure, or any endangered plant, that we're getting like forest grown, where it's an, that's an actual thing where it's called forest grown and people are actually actively planting colonies of these plants in their natural habitat for harvest. So they are not depleting the natural colonies that are just growing in places. So that's wild crafting or foraging, right? That's what that's called. So we do not want to buy endangered plants that have been foraged or wild crafted. We want forest grown or the word cultivated on it. So we need to really make sure that as consumers, we can make a difference by requesting these things, you know, and farmers will only start to expand their farming, um, you know, the things that they farm when there's a demand for it. No one's going to grow forest grown golden seal when nobody wants to buy it. So if we, you know, put the demand out there in the marketplace, that's when, you know, we can be the, the game changers. Uh, so it's really important for us to do that. Um, and to support farmers is a wonderful thing, you know, local farmers. And instead of going to having that middleman where they buy from the farmer and then you buy from the middleman, it's nice to just get right from the farmer. Um, and another thing, Chelsea, that I wanted to mention that's something someone can do. Uh, two years ago, I went before our council here in Brock Township, and I asked them about creating a green liaison committee because I had already been on our dump committee for seven years. So we closed our local dump and it's now just a transfer station. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was a seven year project that I was part of. And then I thought, well, geez, why can't we do a green liaison committee like that? Because I had a secret motive. <laughs> I was <laughs> wanting that, I think that farmers get tax credit for renting out our land for corn, say, to another farmer who wants to spray it. So, right, so there's all that spraying going on. So I can get a tax break if I allow someone to come on my land and do that. But I don't get a tax break if I want to plant wildflowers all there or something. So <laughs> I was trying to think of a way that would help people like me, you know, not have to have a farmer do say hey well we just have our farmer does hay on our land right now so that's great there's no spraying in that <clears throat> but just trying to find ways that you can do this bigger work 
and still receive some breaks, right? But this Green Liaison Committee ends up being something much bigger because not only now is the township gonna plant so many trees every year, so that's part of the mandate. So that was my input was plant, having a mandate of so many trees get planted by the township and so many uh, pollinators get planted for, the, for pollinators, of course. But then once the committee started, then there's other people that are wanting to do no may, no mo may, and all these ideas of no idling you know, vehicles. And so it just grows from there, um, all these ideas. So that's something someone can do in their own community because really every township now in Canada should have a green liaison committee where they're talking green in their area, you know? So that's just kind of a, a natural next step for everybody. So that's something someone else could do as well. Absolutely. And that's such a good point, right? It's not always what you can do as a as an individual. It's how you can be become part of your community to have a, a greater impact. I think that's such a fantastic idea. And we've shared so many great ideas. And some of the ideas are doing nothing, right? Like no mo may, you're literally not doing anything, but in doing nothing, you're doing a great something, you know? So I think that's it too. I think yeah. I think we get hung up on the idea sometimes, but really sometimes less is more. And especially when it comes to, to the environment, the, the less impact, even going chemical free right that's again doing nothing but that has a huge impact especially for um, our bees like we had mentioned earlier and our pollinators and and really the whole world even ourselves as humans and our own health but um, there's just so many different ways that we can make a difference from from big and small and again the change happens beyond where the eyes can see and I think just knowing that is is all the more incentive to to want to keep going so I know I, I could talk to you all day, <laughs> um, but I, I figure we should probably round out. And I think that gives people some really, really great ideas of, of where to start and how they can they can take those first steps in making a difference in their own lives and the communities that surround them and maybe shortening the, the supply chains. Again, that's a great one, supporting their local agriculture, local farmers. And it's funny, once you do those things, you never wonder why, because so many wonderful things come from that, you know, even just being able to meet a local farmer, like that's another connection. And that's another way that you can make a difference because you've already connected with another like mind that probably um, has maybe similar motives or morals or, you know, and it just, it, it keeps the conversation going. And I think so much can come from every conversation that we have so much can be learned and inspired. And, and of course, just like this conversation, hopefully that hopefully everyone is able to take something away from this in in respect to being able to move forward and, and create an action of some kind within their own lives. And um, is there anything that we didn't touch on that you maybe want to bring up and chat about before we before we hop off? Or did we, we chat about everything that you maybe had wanted to talk about today? Well, we chatted about a lot, didn't we? We but did. I think that, uh, sustain, sustainability as you and I have been working together a little bit on sustainability. So I feel like that that's a big one to leave people with, you yeah. know? So part of that is making sure, um, you know, for the, actually for them to research a little bit on their own, how to be more sustainable because with, with every educational session, there should be homework. Mm -hmm. So everyone's homework should be from this talk, to learn how to be more sustainable, even if they can take one action, you know, a new action that they implement each year or something, it will make a big difference. So I think that's the homework. Let's give them homework, Chelsea. All right, it's go time. <laughs> and to touch on that too is regenerative actions too, right? How can we be sustainable, but how can we regenerate, right? We can also, ways that we can do both and incorporate those two aspects into our daily life. Because a lot of us, if we were to sustain the way we're living, it's not actually quite sustainable. So how can we be more no. sustainable and maybe incorporate regenerative regenerative practices too, right? But, um, and of course, the, the beautiful thing is that always looks so different to everybody because everyone is on their own path and, and everyone has their own skills and for good reason, because we're not all meant to do the same thing and, and be of benefit to each other and the world in in the same way it's supposed to look very different right it's we have people that like we're talking about right we're the tree planners maybe we're not the the book writers or maybe we're both whatever it is right finding what you love to do finding what you're good at and finding how you can make a difference and 
in doing that, I think you inspire people to pay it forward as well. And again, it's just that ripple, ripple of change. So hopefully it starts here for some people. Um, you've said a, a, an amazing quote and it's always stuck with me. Giving back is good for the soul. And, and I love to think that. And sometimes if we're feeling down in the dumps, giving back is, is such a great way to get out of a funk or, you know, just again, it's, it, it's a way that it brings everyone together for such a greater good. So, um, I think, I think we've given everybody some pretty good homework today. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you, Chelsea. This was really great because I feel like your work is really important and it will reach a lot of people and make a difference. So thank you for that. Oh, well, thank you so much for your time today, Penny. I, like I said, I can talk to you probably all day if I could. So um, thank you for sitting down with me today. Thank you for sharing your path and the ways that you're able to, to make a difference and inspire others to do the same. I, I am so grateful. Thank you so much.